Greetings and welcome to Archeo Thoughts. You're. Oh, oh, it is always a technical malfunction. Had speakers on on my phone while monitoring the chat. I will start this again. Greetings and welcome to Archeo Thoughts Talks. I'm your host, Bill Ochter. Today is just me and you. With no guests this week, we'll be covering some recent archaeological news, events that happened a uh, hundred years ago today, and historical birthdays. Uh, you're more than welcome to ask questions in the chat at any time. This is a conversation. So, without further ado, let's dive into the news. I got fancy this week, and... Uh, trying out some technology so forgive it if it doesn't work out so well so this week or maybe last week uh, published in the journal of archaeological methods and theory um, which is public uh, an open access uh, one so uh, when I when it gets into the show notes you can read the full article yourself anyway it's an article entitled Bronze Age Swordsmanship, New Insights from Experiments and Wear Analysis. So in this, as you can see in the picture there, um, they are attempting to do some experimental archaeology. For those who aren't familiar with experimental archaeology, um, it's taking the materials that we commonly find in the ground surface and then try to replicate how they were either created or how they were used in the past so that when we run into them, we can better analyze them. Um, these in particular, um, they were focusing on Middle and Late Bronze Age Europe. Um, it, it seems to be the uh, what they were what they were focusing on specifically, and by and this was and the other thing about experimental archaeology versus like you know like you might be thinking, hey you know. Um, LARPing and other types of things, uh, or, or true like uh, medieval combat uh, specialists uh, do this kind of stuff all the time. The difference here, and as you can see, they're not dressed for combat, they're dressed for protection. Um, most likely they're not going at each other with any sort of speed. What they are trying to do is create a, um, what they quote on here, uh, quote, we present a four-step experimental methodology, including both controlled and actualistic experiments. Meaning they're looking to replicate these experiments. This, this is very important. And this is what separates um, this from some of the other sort of like uh, more amateur or not, not amateur, um, but some of the, the non-practicing uses uh, of this kind of thing. They, they are trying to replicate this kind of wear uh, so that other archaeologists can experiment and see if they get similar results. Um, that way then we can feel more comfortable about uh, the wear use analysis and how these uh, weapons are deteriorated uh, on there. So you could sort of separate what's something natural from falling down. I mean, these are bronze, so they're a little softer metals um, during it, you know, so they, they can be uh, damaged pretty easily, relatively easily, in comparison to something like steel. So, yeah, there's a, the whole article has a ton of pictures. Um, I didn't put them all up here because we got a lot to talk about today and a short amount of time to do it. But they were playing with replicas, so that's always something you could uh, argue about. Um, the quality of the bronze within um, the metal is definitely something that could be looked at uh, for further analysis um, to see if that makes a difference. I mean, they did try to experiment with the different, with their metallurgy when they were making these things to try to make it contain the amounts of lead and other materials and impurities uh, that you would have found during the weapons of that time. So it is something they have thought about, but you, you know, it could always be re-examined uh, for further on this. But I do find it very interesting and very cool um, that you know, archaeology lets you go do a little bit of sword fighting. 
uh, to pr play with that. So that is always fun. But you know what else is fun? Well, horseshoes. Well, specifically horseshoes from uh, Vikings. Um, so this one's more in the popular press. Uh, I found this on uh, in Vice magazines, well, Vice Online, and with the with the uh, you know provocative title, a lost Viking mountain pass has melted out of the ice in Norway. Climate change has exposed the epic ancient route, which was likely abandoned due to the Black Plague, revealing animal skeletons and artifacts. So in this article, it's it's a it's a short article, but there is a link to the broader study, um, which was published uh, last week in the journal Antiquity, which is linked in there, so you can click through that to find there. And that article is, is, is titled, Crossing the Ice, an Ice Age to Medieval Mountain Pass at Lean Breen, Norway. You can see there, they, they, they've, they've cut out all the sensationalism. It's strictly an observational like this is what we saw and this is what's there so so there and I believe this one is also open access yes it is so if you click on through the article there you can once again read the entire article and that is a very good thing um, as far as someone like me who's no longer in the Academy uh, getting my hands on journal articles is a uh, is a bit of a challenge uh, so I always appreciate it when uh, different magazines and different things will offer uh, their articles and so forth on open access so you, so you can read them. Um, and they're definitely in this article attributing, you know, the current uh, human-induced uh, uh, climate change for exposing this particular area. This area was buried under ice uh, and is now exposed uh, due to climate change which is unfortunate because it's part of our climate crisis, uh, but gives us as archeologists an opportunity uh, to see things maybe in a state of preservation that we haven't before or different occupied landscapes uh, on there. Uh, because the particular, like these artifacts that they're finding here, um, Indicating usage beginning about uh, AD 3, oh, they indicate usage uh, from about AD 300 to about AD 1500 with the peak usage around one, AD 1000 uh, during the Viking Age. Uh, so they're a little more hands offish with the, using the Viking word uh, on there, and that, that's probably appropriate. Uh, for this article, but you could see on the uh, the horseshoe, it's got a level of detail. It's still got some of its uh, nails still in place on there. It's a very unique design uh, for horseshoe as compared to our modern horseshoe um, on there. Um, I'd have to have a horseshoe expert, and trust me, there are horse experts. There are people who just love all horse artifacts. Um, and they're probably yelling and screaming right now about the exact design of this, the exact kind of nails that are being used. Maybe they're not even called nails or called something else and they're throwing stuff at their monitor right now. I'm sorry. Um, but it is beautiful. That's how it's coming out from the ground. So that's some, that's an incredible find. And we're going to find more of those things as, as climate change uh, continues. I don't know if I'm bopping my head behind uh, my screen or not. As this climate change continues, we're going to see more of this happening. So, once again, like I said, it's horrible because of what's happening to the planet, but it creates an opportunity. It sounds a lot like cultural resource management. <laughs> uh, a little gallows humor for the morning or afternoon out here. So, do, 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 do. speaking of gallows humor... We're going to switch topics here and talk a little bit about more current things. Um, you know, I couldn't go a week without go talking about COVID-19. Um, so everyone is having to adjust now. Now that we've been over a month of lockdowns and understanding that even when we go back, it will not be the same. It's going to be a new normal. 
uh, different organizations, different groups, different entities are going to have to figure out how to respond to this and how to make these things uh, work out and happen. And the same, you know, and that is going to be true for our friends over at the museums. So the American Alliance of Museums has published a uh, resource online. Once again, all this stuff is going to be in the show notes. Um, I'll try to get them into the show notes on the Twitch side, but definitely when this gets published over on YouTube, it will have a thorough list of everything I've been showing you today uh, so that you too can go uh, access those resources. Um, as I was just saying, so the American Alliance of Museums has compiled a guide uh, to help individual, you know, large and smaller museums um, prepare uh, both for their staffs and for their for their visitors uh, on the impact of, of COVID-19. How do you how do you do a museum um, with that? How do you open the doors and let people in? Um, what do you have to change? Um, what legal liabilities? I mean, that's the one thing with, you know, this is an advocacy group for museums. So they have to think of the museum as also as a, as a business, as an entity. Um, so they have to be able to protect both their staff and their visitors uh, during this. So how do you do that? Um, and it gives a whole list of resources. Let me see. Like, for example, they're preparing to reopen is still a coming soon item. Uh, preparing for closures is, is open, though, so you could definitely uh, do that. Um, educating the public on COVID-19. Um, that's also going to be a, a role of, of museums, even if that's not your focus. Um, you need to keep people constantly uh, educated so they remember, even when they're in your space, they need to have COVID-19 on the top of their minds um, so they can act accordingly, social distancing and whatever other steps we need to be taking um, in the future uh, to protect ourselves and everybody around us. So that's more of this. This is much more of a something great to read. Um, if you are uh, in museums or curious about museums or if you run historic houses or you're involved in any sort of public archaeology, I would say this is also probably a good resource to pop your head in. Uh, some of those conversations are going to be very similar. Uh, in terms of like, you know, the workers and education, uh, what financial relief there is available out there if, you, uh, if, you, if you're in need of those kinds of things, um, and how to, how to reopen at some point. Because um, I know that's, that's still a topic we've been talking about. We talked about it a few times on this show, how this works. Now, this, you know, shutdown is hurting a lot of businesses, and it's definitely... Um, it's, it's causing pain, but you know, we need to, we need to be able to stick together, uh, in order to, uh, in order to get through this together. So that's sort of the news for the week that sort of gets us caught up in what's going on in the world, uh, on that. So, so let's move on to what happened a hundred years ago today. So first we got up is a uh, is the front page of the Cheyenne State Leader, um, which is mentioning the fact that uh, at this time the Mexican Revolution is uh, is spreading. So this this would be uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, so it gives a little news about that. Uh, some information about uh, a presidential nominee, Milter. I'm not sure who he is. Um, but this other news article, sort of in the middle, underneath the picture of the woman uh, with the Billy Whiskers, author of A Grandmother, told her first, told her own grand, ah, bah, bah, bah. I can't read right now. All right, let me try this again. <clears throat> Billy Whiskers author, a grandmother, first told her own kid. Oh, first told her own kitties stories of well-known goat. That gets uh, top billing right underneath the uh, Mexican Revolution spreading. 
So. So underneath that article, though, there's another article which states 15 shot when IWW picket and Butte guards clash. So this is in Montana. Reds massing in Montana industrial area. Police reserve called out in situation in city ominous. So this is the uh, international workers. Oh, man, I'm going to have to turn in my card. I got the other W. You guys are going to call me out on that. Anyway, let's go to the next article. <laughs> this is from the uh, Laramere. Uh, Boomerang. North Park issues call for help. Troops rused or rushed. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on. There we go. That's the Laramere Boomerang. I'm getting used to this, all right? I have not used this other screen before. Let me know if you think this works. Let me know if you want to see more of this uh, on, on the show. Uh, if it's something you, that you're enjoying seeing, sort of the uh, a little added a visual element uh, to everything going on here. Um, so, so let me know. Do, 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 do. What was I saying? Troops. All right. Okay, it's better. Troops rushed to Butte to... Disrupt Soviet riots. Wounded and dead number many in red stampede that threatened a Soviet rule. Striking miners, most of whom are IWW, spreading pop uh, propaganda, asking all unions to walk out. So what's going on? What's going on in these two articles on here? They're actually referring to something that happened the day before something called the Anaconda Road Massacre. Um, on April 21st, 1920, during a minor strike in Butte, Montana, company guards fired on striking miners uh, picketing near the Anaconda Copper Mining Company, uh, killing one individual, Tom Manning, and injuring 16 others an event known as the Anaconda Road Massacre. So, the International Workers of the World unite, and I'll have to go and sing the first international song 10 times in a row in the mirror or something as, as repute for this. But, so that's what's going on. We have, you know, they have to remember the early 20th century, we got minor strikes going on, you know, sort of blending over from the late 19th century. Uh, in the United States. In addition, um, by 1920, you're seeing throughout Europe and the uh, North America, um, the influence of uh, socialism, communism, um, the Soviet presence um, at this point. The world is sort of still in tumult um, after, the, after the First World War. Um, People are wanting, you know, workers are still wanting better rights, especially after fighting a war like that. They're recovering uh, from a pandemic, um, which should also sound familiar to people, um, which causes a little distress. And, you know, they're, they are looking for uh, relief and, and, you know, for being able to work without risk of dying, for able to, you know, get a fair pay for a fair amount of work, to be able to get health care, to be able to see their children to be able to have their children not die from poison because of all the poison water in the area. You know, the little things like that um, are, are sort of what they're looking for on here. So, so that's it. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting though, that this is, you know, two newspapers are mentioning this at the same time. Um, at the same time, the newspapers are also talking about the Mexican Revolution. Um, the Laramie Boomerang. That's a great name for a newspaper. I wonder if it still, is, if, if it still exists. Cazara, Caz, Caranza acts peace with Sonora rebels. So that's, that's an update on the uh, Mexican Revolution. So the North Park issues call for help is a story about snowbound and without feed. Uh, 40,000 headstock may 
star perish if relief is not found. So there, there's uh, some livestock that's being kept away and then people are looking for help to get food up there. So this, you know, I mean, it's, it's, that's the kind of area this is. And you got, and you got the baseball tables at the bottom. Speaking of which, although we are not currently having our baseball season, poo, poo, poo. Um, here's a flashback to opening game in Washington, D.C. between the Washington Nationals. No, not those Washington Nationals. These are the first ones. The ones who left town, and I think, no, I, these aren't even the ones who become the Texas Rangers. These are the first, first ones. Um, and I forget where they where they end up going. Um, with the first pitch being thrown out by Vice President Thomas Marshall. Uh, this is about, I wouldn't say about six months after Woodrow Wilson has his stroke. So this is when they're sort of in the period of trying to keep him out of the public. But it's also interesting to see sort of the, how the traditions have changed. Um, the vice president's in the stand, just throwing the pitch out rather than sort of the bigger ceremony they have now, uh, which is probably more for a TV event of coming out to the pitcher's mound and then humiliating yourself when you can't get the ball all the way down to home plate. So I, th I think that's why I did it this way so that you could do a really soft throw and not get it very far. Um, but yeah, it's it's a reminder that, you know, we got the bunting there and stuff like that. The mix of politics, military, and professional sports has a long history. Long, long history. And we're missing sports right now. So, you know, this is for anybody out there who's missing any sports. Hey, here's some stuff for you. Yay. So, so this all happened 100 years ago today. Not the most exciting day. But it was a day, um, like any other day, and stuff did happen. So let us now move on to our birthday boys. And, and for today, I, I am focusing on two birthday boys. There are plenty of people who had birthdays today, um, but there's two I wanted to focus on. Our first birthday boy, Immanuel Kant, was born... April 20th, 22nd, I should, oh, I'm doing it, today's April 22nd, I shouldn't get that wrong, 1724. And he's a major figure in the modern philosophy movement. Um, synthesizing, he's, he's, you know, impenetrable to read. If anyone's tried to read a uh, critique of pure reason or critique of practical reason or critique of powers of judgment, um, they're obtuse. Um, he makes arguments that the human understanding is the source of general law of nature, that structure of all experience, and that human reason gives itself the moral law. I'm reading all this from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophies, uh, sort of summary of Immanuel Kant, which will also be in the, in the show notes, which is our basis for belief in God, freedom, and immortality. Therefore, scientific knowledge, morality, and religious beliefs are mutually consistent and secure because they all rest on the same foundation of human anatomy, which is also the final end of nature, according to the teleological worldview reflecting judgment that Kant introduces to unify the theoretical and practical parts of his philosophical system. This is the really synthesized uh, version of, of Kant. Everything else gets worse than this. But I think, you know, the meme I found online um, probably is as a better summary uh, of his philosophies. Your feels are superiors to your reels. Ah, I'm way off now. I need like a, I need another monitor. I got two going, but I need like a third monitor. Or I need a camera crew. Or a rocking music video. So that's our boy, Kant. And it's funny because Kant is very important 
to pretty much every thinker of the 19th century, uh, including Karl Marx and uh, Friedrich uh, Engel. And someone is, is a reader uh, of those two uh, who also has a birthday today. And this is, this boy has a very, very happy 150th birthday. That's right. Our good boy, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, better known as Lenin. Born today, April 22nd, 1870, 150 years ago. And as we all know, there ain't no party like a communist party because the communist party don't stop until 1993. <laughs> well, to be fair, China still has theirs going, so CCP is still there. So Lenin is, was known as the sort of the, the revolutionary uh, intellectual uh, behind the Russian Revolution in that he sort of brought in sort of the praxis uh, of it. So it wasn't just sort of the talking around and theorizing about communist theory. Um, he wanted to put it into action on there. So, you know, he's, he's growing up, his, his brother's executed, he's expelled from school. He's got a lot of reasons to be angry. He goes to St. Petersburg in 1893 to become a, a senior Marxist advocate. Gets arrested tons and tons of times. He's, like I said, he's a prominent theorist, and he even becomes a prominent theorist in the uh, Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, uh, which emerges in 1903. All right. I'll admit my, my Lenin's not as big, and I'm trying to read. Uh, right now to get some stuff on here, but I just wanted to make sure you to put out there that uh, So he's very key to it and he you know, he does take in the step into the light limelight um, by 18 by 1918 uh, Stepping in after the October revolutions uh, to fill the power vacuum um, leads the Bolsheviks through the Civil War um, to to push down all all other take all other claimants uh, to power in the uh, into what becomes the Soviet into Russia, which becomes the Soviet Union, um, only really to have his health failing sort of right at the end of that, um, and then by 1924 he he has died sort of this, but the Soviet Union only haven't been around for two years um, as, a, uh, as a as a as a proper state even though he was a, was a leader of the, during the revolution. So this has led a lot to the sort of myths that have gone up and down uh, for there. Uh, for instance, during the Soviet Union, um, Lenin and the image of Lenin and even the body of Lenin uh, was seen as almost a saint-like figure uh, for this uh, openly uh, atheistic, uh, organization. He was the patron saint. He, he was the replacement uh, for their worship uh, during that time period. Then sort of the reformers um, came in and the image of Lenin sort of goes down a little bit. Um, then in the post-Soviet Union, sort of everyone's image goes down a little bit. Um, then now you have sort of a, on the left, a sort of Lenin revival, and I don't even want, want necessarily want to call it a full revival, but there there are there are uh, intellectual thinkers on the left um, who I guess are still looking for a left project and are going back to looking at Lenin as the uh, the theorist and not necessarily the politician. Um, I'll admit my, my, my reading of uh, Lenin the Theorist is uh, not very big right now. I do have a book 
of his, and I'm still in the introduction by Slova Zizek, uh, so I actually haven't read any of the words of Lenin yet. But I figured this is one of my little favorite goofy images. It seems to be a significant day um, that may or may not be covered in most news uh, going out here. Um, it's one of those types of things, you know, to a lot of people, this is a villain. And to a lot of people, that might be rightfully so. But this is someone who also changed the world. So I think noting it is probably the best. Does it have to be celebrated? Not really. Um, I'll leave that to you. Um, I would probably celebrate Lenin more than I would Stalin. Stalin is an absolute scumbag. Oh, the tanky's going to get me now. But, yeah. So, you know what? Doing birthdays of long dead people, especially when they're not like funny people, is it, it, sort of a, a, a downer. It's like, hey, this is a guy who helped lead to a lot of the wars of the 20th century and even some of the tensions which exist today and possibly through his small success ruined the larger success of the project he was looking to conduct so that that is all that is all we have today. Today is going was going to be a shorter show. Um, if anybody has any thoughts or any comments or anything, I'm, you're more than welcome in the chat right now. Uh, let's put some uh, some comments in. But with all that said, if you want to be a guest of the show, uh, please uh, contact me. And I'm going to tell you how to contact me in a second. Do, 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 do. Uh, also, let me know. I, I need some feedback on these things. Now that we're, we're six weeks in, um, I've had a big group. I've done a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews. I've done interviews that have been focused on sort of the person within the archaeology. We had some interviews which put a little bit of the archaeology into it. We did today, which was sort of a, 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 a sort of a hodgepodge of solo type of things. What are the kind of things you're interested in? What are the kind of things you want to see? Um, the goal of this uh, program is to sort of provide a platform to talk about archaeology and to talk about the archaeologist uh, and the thought. So that's why Kant and Lenin are not sort of weird topics for this because they are thinkers and um, especially Kant, uh, those are kind of the kind of thinkers that, that do show up in some of the theoretical uh, analysis. Uh, that um, is done, um, at least on the cultural studies level. So, thank you for joining me. If you have any questions, comments, you can contact me at ArcheoThoughts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. My email address is ArcheoThoughts at gmail.com. If you like what you've been seeing for the past six weeks, please consider becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash archaeothoughts. As little as one dollar can help bring more and higher quality content to you. Links to everything I talked about today uh, will, will be in the show notes. Like I said, they might be the Twitch show notes today, but they will definitely be on the YouTube show notes when they go up. Please like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word. So once again, thank you and be safe out there. Goodbye. <laughs>